This is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over if my story's just begun. And failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Yeah, failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Ooh, lay your burdens down. Ooh, here in the father's house. Check your shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, you're in the Father's house. Arrival's not the end game, the journey's where you are. You never wanted perfect, you just wanted my heart. And the story isn't over if the story isn't good. Failure's never final when the father's in the room. Failure's never final when the father's in the room. Ooh, lay your burdens down. Ooh, here in the father's house. Check your shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, you're in the Father's house. Prodigals come home, the helpless find hope. Love is on the move when the father's in the room. Prison doors fling wide, the dead come to life. Love is on the move when the father's in the room. Miracles take place, the cynical find faith. Love is breaking through when the father's in the room. The Jericho walls are quaking, strongholds now are shaking. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Ooh, lay your burdens down. Ooh, here in the Father's house. Check your shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, you're in the Father's house. Lay your burdens down. Ooh, here in the Father's house. Check your shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, you're in the Father's house. Can y'all hear me? How about now? All right, good. Most people say I don't need a mic anyway. Um, I remember the first church I pastored, after two months they took away my mic. So uh, that's okay. But uh, It's good to be with you here this morning. Good morning, church. Um, it's been a while since... Huh? Sorry. I, I, I work at Walmart and I wear this eight hours a day, so to be honest, Chris, I'm so used to wearing it nowadays I, I feel so natural with it. But... Uh, it's good to be with you here this morning. It's been, a, it's been a little bit since I've been here, but I always love to come back to First Baptist. Some of y'all from the back may have looked at me from the back and said, man, his head has got balder over the last two years, and you would be correct. It has. I'm thinning as natural as it goes. I'm, almost, I'm 37 years old now, Chris, so I guess when I get about my dad's age, which is pretty ancient, 
um, it'll be uh, pretty much bald. So I'm looking forward to that. But uh, no, it's good to be with you this morning. Uh, let's pray and uh, let's invite the Holy Spirit to come with us during this service. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for this day that you've given us, God. Thank you for the praise that has been lifted up, Lord. And uh, Lord, we are so happy that we are not here alone um, in the midst of the fear of this pandemic and the, the loss of loved ones and all those things that are going on right now in our community and in our country. God, we are so happy that we do not stand alone against this. But Lord, you have given us a spirit of boldness, a spirit of hope, not a spirit of fear. Lord, I just pray that we just lean on that during these uncertain times. Lord, I pray during this message, Lord, that you would speak to your people. You would speak through me. Um, Lord, I, I know that I'm unworthy. I know I'm undeserving. But I also know every single person in here is the same way, God. But you love us anyway. And Lord, I just pray that you make a powerful impact during this service today, God. And that lives will be changed. Eternities will be changed. And you will be glorified through it all. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, many of you may know me. Many of you may not. Um, it's Like I said, it's been a little bit. My name is Chris Francis, as they already said. Um, some of you may know me from my dad. Uh, as much as I pick on him, uh, believe me, he deserves it. But uh, I love him dearly. And some of y'all may know me through my dad, Rusty, as well. But most of you know me either through one of two ways. Walmart, you've seen me at Walmart in Glasgow. If you venture out that way, I feel sorry for you. But anyway, Walmart in Glasgow, or you know me through ministry. This month, 16 years ago, I was called to preach at an altar on a Wednesday night. I can't believe it's been 16 years since I was called into ministry. But most of you know me through my preaching. Some of you may know me uh, through my pastoring. I've pastored four churches in the last 16 years. Some of you may know that I served as a discipleship director at River Lake for a little bit. Some of you may know I graduated from Liberty Baptist Theological Seminary. You may know those things. And I could go on and on about accolades and things that I want you to see. But this is the reality. Nine years ago, I was pastoring my second church. And nine years ago, while I was serving... And on the front, it looked like I was serving Jesus Christ. Nine years ago, I was sacrificing to another God in my life. And before you get your stones ready to throw at me and cast me out as a pagan, let me, let me explain what I'm talking about. This God was not a, a, a golden calf or some kind of pentagram in my closet. This God was much more inconspicuous than that. This was the God of ministry. You see, six, nine years ago, I was... Growing and seeing that church grow at Southside Baptist, I was seeing people come and fill the pews. I was seeing people say, man, you're a great preacher, Chris. You're a great, you're a great leader and all those things. And, and I thought, I'm going to move my way up in ministry. I'm going to get it. I'm going to make sure I invest as much time as I can to make this a success. And I sacrificed my time to ministry. At the time, I was going through seminary, and, and you could decide to do twice the amount of work and get done half the time. And since I was so arrogant and prideful, I said, I'm going to do that. But the problem with that is working on a master's degree is hard enough, but getting in half the time is even harder. So I spent my time locked in my room, basically away from my family, studying, preparing, doing book reports, and all those things. So not only was I sacrificing time, I was sacrificing my family to the God of ministry. I was, I was sacrificing my family. My kids barely knew me in that day. We'd just given birth to my youngest daughter, Micah, who is my princess. And she knows it and she can get away with anything with me and she knows it. Just don't tell her. I'll wait till she's here so maybe she knows. But, yeah, we just give birth to her, and, and, man, I loved that, and I enjoyed that, but the reality was I wasn't spending time with them. I wasn't investing in them. On the outside, it looked like I was the perfect family, the perfect uh, pasture, the perfect everything. Young, had the whole world in front of me, but the reality was I was sacrificing my kids to the God of ministry. I was sacrificing my wife to the God of ministry. I was hardly spending any time with her. Unless I wanted something from her. Not only that, but also I sacrificed in my fellowship with God to the God of ministry. And that sounds 
That sounds stupid, don't it? To you, maybe? A pastor who's preaching every single Sunday, teaching Sunday school, teaching Wednesday nights, doing visitation to, to people, doing funerals, doing weddings. It sounds stupid to you that, that a pastor, a preacher, would be sacrificing his fellowship and relationship with the God who he is in front of everybody else proclaiming. But I was. You see, I wasn't reading my Bible in private study. I was reading my Bible to teach you guys and preach to you guys. Not literally you, but you know what I mean. I was doing that. In fact, Chris, I was given an assignment in seminary once that you had to pray for an hour. And you know what I did? I got down on my knees and prayed, and I couldn't make five minutes praying to God before I got bored. And thinking I could be doing something so much more productive with my time. Felt like I was talking to a wall. I felt no joy, felt no intimacy, felt no nothing. I went through the motions at church, and because I've learned how to be a good public speaker, at least I thought, I did that well, and no one saw a thing. But the reality of it is, one day I woke up and I looked in the mirror, and I said, man, Lord, I don't feel joy, I don't feel passion, I don't feel peace, I don't feel purpose, I don't feel hope, I don't feel anything in what is going on. And then it all came crashing down. One Monday, I woke up and my wife told me she's leaving me. She's gone. That Thursday, that same week, I got my degree from seminary. And on that same day, I found out my wife was with another man. Later on, I found she was pregnant with that other man. Trying to take her back multiple times, but it didn't work in the end. I ended up having to get a divorce. And you know what happened? The same ministry God that I sacrificed to for so many years gave and turned his back on me because I had to resign my pastor because I was divorced now. And everything that I'd sacrificed to this God meant nothing in that moment. Now, I don't know about you. That may not be you. In fact, it probably isn't you. But I do know this. Every single person in this room has gods in your life that are vying for your attention. You have gods in your life that are vying for your attention. It may be something that's sinful and you're hiding from everybody else. It may be an opioid addiction or a benzo addiction or a drug addiction. It might be something like that. It may be a pornography addiction. Oh, boy, I said that in church. I shouldn't have. Should have. Man. Right? It might be something you're watching on your phone when you shouldn't be, when your wife or your kids aren't around. It may be something that's not like that. It may be a sport. It may be a politician. It may be your family, your wife, your kids that you made your God. Maybe your job. Maybe a hobby. I don't know what it is, but I do know this. God is a jealous God. And he will not share the throne on your life with anybody. I found that out the hard way. Even if it looks good, you may make church your God. You may make the Baptist denomination your God. You may make tradition your God. You may make religion your God. And everybody around you be looking at you and saying, man, you are a great follower of Christ. But in all reality, you're not following after Jesus. You're following after your own God that you put above him. And this is what happens. When you put another God above God, you begin to lose your fellowship with him. And one day, maybe not now, but one day you'll look in the mirror and say, why am I even coming to church? Why? I don't get anything out of it. I sing these stupid songs and they don't mean anything to me. Right? I sing them. I hear this preacher babble for 30 minutes and I'm already thinking about where I'm going to eat and what game's on after. So why am I even doing this? And in reality, the joy that you once had, the passion that once drove you to the altar and that Jesus saved you that day, you don't feel it no more. And you blame the preacher, and you blame the church, and you blame the worship leader, you blame the community, you blame your family, you blame your spouse, you blame your children. But in all reality, the blame falls on you. That's where it falls. I want to look at a text this morning that gives us an answer for that. I'm not trying to be mean to you, church. I'm trying to be honest to you. Because I want to be honest with you. I wish someone would have told me this nine years ago. 
I wish someone would have said, you know what? You can be going to church and be far from God. I wish someone would have said, you can be preaching and be far from God. You can be leading worship and being far from God. You can be playing the piano and be far from God. You can be going through all these motions and be far from God. But the answer to that is this, church. Why I'm telling you this is not to make you mad or upset. I'm telling you this because God has such a better life plan for you than that. He has such a greater life. A life full of joy and peace and purpose and hope. A life full of passion and filled with his presence that makes us fall to our knees and lift our hands and say, Holy are you, God, and worthy of you to be praised. That's the life that God wants for you. And I find the answer to how we can find that life in the book of Hosea. If you want to turn with me there. Hosea. I love the story of Hosea. Hosea is a preacher. He's a prophet. He's a man of God. And through Hosea, God has a message for the people of Israel. Look at verse 2 of chapter 1 of Hosea. He says, when the Lord began to speak by Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, go take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry, for the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. You recognize a word there that's said multiple times? If you want to underline that in your Bible, that's a key word here. It's harlot. We have an English word for it, but because there's children here, I won't say it. It starts with a W. You can catch my drift. They, this person that he is commanding Hosea to go marry is named Gomer. Now, I don't know about you, but that would have been a tip-off for me. What kind of... Never mind. Is any woman named Gomer here today? No? Okay, good. Man, that's a horrible name, isn't it? I thought about naming my daughter that, but I thought, no, I better not. But anyway, uh, Gomer, is he's commanded to go marry Gomer, and he's told Gomer is going to cheat on you. Now, I would ask this. I would say... How many of you have been cheated on? But I don't want you to do that. I've been cheated on, and it stinks to be cheated on, don't it? Now, how many of us would say, if God said, go and marry this person, they're going to cheat on you multiple times and leave you, would say, yeah, God, let me sign up for that, right? No. But Hosea says, yes, I'll do it. I'll do it. Because God has a message to the children of Israel. And through their children, he shows Israel where they're at. Now, listen to this. We're going to look at the second child that's born here in verse 6. It says, and he conceived again and bore a daughter, and her name was Lorama. Now, Lorama means that I will no longer have mercy. Now, what this means is not that God doesn't still love Israel, but what he's saying to Israel is, I no longer find favor in you. I no longer find favor in you. Now, don't miss this. Listen, this is what's happening to Israel. They're going out and they're having battles. They're fighting these battles and they're losing. They're losing and losing and losing and losing. They even bring the Ark of the Covenant with them one time to a battle. Thinking that's going to surely bring us to victory. And they still lose. And God is saying, you guys don't understand. You can have your temple. You can have your incense. You can have your songs. But they're all disgusting to me because I don't find favor in you no more. I don't find favor. So, so every day they were going out and thinking, I'm going to have victory because I am a follower of Yahweh. But they really are finding defeat everywhere they go. You know what I see in the church? I see a bunch of people come in here with chains on. And they wonder why they're not having victory in their life. They're struggling. They're falling down. They're miserable all the time. And they're saying, God, why am I not having victory? Maybe it's because that God no longer has favor on you. Look at a third child. It's found in verse 9. His name is Loama. And his name means you are not my people. How would you like to have that as your name in Israel at that time? That would stink. Everyone looks around. Oh, look, there's Loama, not my people. I guess that's what Hosea thinks about us, right? That, but that was continuous message to them. What's God saying? God's saying, you may call yourself my people. You may say you're my followers. But your actions show something completely different. So I don't consider you my people no more. 
And listen to me. How many people in our churches today that are coming in our churches and sitting in our pews that, that God is looking at you and you say, they say to you, you may call yourself a Christ follower, but I don't consider you that. Now, I'm not saying they're lost. I'm not saying they're going to hell, but I am saying this. I can sit there and put on a Marine uniform, shave my head, and look all sorts of tough, but the reality of it is, unless I'm going through boot camp, unless I'm doing the work of a Marine, I'm not a Marine. Then how many times in the church are we going to sit there and say, because a person comes down and sits at an altar or sits down in the pew and they don't live their life for God, they don't live their life for Christ, that that makes them a Christian. And God is saying, no, no, I'm not at the throne of your life. I'm not number one in your life. You can't say that you're a follower of Jesus and not follow after Jesus. Let me say that again. You cannot say you're a follower of Jesus and not follow after Jesus. You can't do it. And so what God is saying to the children of Israel, yet they've got a problem. They've got an issue here. And I want you to see what's happened. Go with me to chapter 13. Chapter 13, just a few pages over. 13, chapter 13, verses 5 through 6. What's happened to Israel? And then we're going to get to the solution and I'll be done. Listen. Chapter 13, verses 5 through 6. He says, I knew you in the wilderness and in the land of great drought. He's saying, I knew you when you were nobody. I knew you when you were down and you had nothing to hold on to. And when they had pasture, they were filled. They were filled and their heart was exalted. Therefore, they forgot me. Don't miss this. Listen, listen. This is what happened to Israel. Israel was down and out. What did God do? He redeemed them. He set them free, right? He said, I'm going to set you free. I'm going to do miracles. I'm going to do works that you can never imagine. And I'm going to redeem you. You will be the pride and you will be the, the people that the whole world looks to and says, man, what God are they serving? And what happened to Israel? They begin to get filled. They begin to have victory after victory. Their church begin to get filled. The people begin to get saved. And before long, they begin patting their chest, excuse me, patting their chest and saying, man, look at what we've done. Right? Look at the victory that we've done. Look at the things that we've done. They got filled. And then look, they forgot God. They forgot why they were even doing what they're doing. They forgot why they were even coming to church. They forgot why they were singing their songs. They forgot why they were reading the scriptures. In fact, they lost the scriptures. But this is the good news for Israel. Listen, this is a message of redemption for you guys and deliverance. And here, I, I, I'll be done. Look, look, this story has a happy ending. Look here at chapter 3. I love this. Chapter 3, verse 1. Look, Hosea is left by Gomer. Gomer leaves Hosea. And she cheats and she cheats and she cheats and she cheats until finally she comes to the point where she is indebted to a man and she loses all the money that she little had and she owes her body to this man. And so what he does is he puts her on an auction block to sell her for her body. Now, I want you to picture this, church. It's not a good picture, but I want you to picture this. Gomer is put up on an auction block. She is completely nude because people want to see the merchandise. And they come there to buy her. And this is what God says to Hosea in chapter 3, verse 1. Then the Lord said to me, go again, love a woman who is loved by a lover and who is committing adultery. Just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel who look to other gods and love the raisin cakes of the pagans. It says, so I bought her for myself for the 15 shekels of silver and one half homers of barley. Amen. Praise God. Y'all don't get it, do you? Look, look. The same amount that Hosea is commanded. First of all, he's commanded to go and buy his wife. 
There are other people bidding for his wife while she's up there naked. After she's left him, after she's cheated on him, after she's abandoned him, he is commanded to go and buy her. And he is bidding, 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 bidding until finally it gets to the exact same amount of silver that in Jesus' day Judas took to betray Jesus Christ. Y'all see that? Look. That's not by accident. It's the same amount of silver if you add it up. That Judas was given to betray Jesus. And what is he saying here? He's saying, Israel, you have turned from me. You have made church something it wasn't meant to be. But I am not giving up on you. Man, that's the good news of the gospel. Not just for the lost, but for the church as a whole. You see, I had walked away from God. I had abandoned God. I had made another God in my life on the throne. And I had went through the motions. I had wore the suit to Sunday. I had done all those things to make you people love me. But the reality of it is... I never really was fully in love with God until I realized what he had done for me on that cross and that no matter what I do, I'm not too far from his love. Man, I realized that that day. And this is what you need to see in this text, that that I was on that altar. Because in this story, you're not Hosea. Some of you are thinking, man, I'm Hosea. No, you're Gomer. You're the harlot. I'm the harlot. Because we are all far from God because of our sin. But thank God that he didn't leave us there. We were on that altar while the other gods of this world were vying for our service. And and Jesus Christ came and said, no, I'll pay the price for him. I'll pay the price for her. Man, look, one more text and I'm done. Chapter 1. Look what he says to Israel. Don't miss this. Verse 10, chapter 1. He says, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be of the sands of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And it shall come to pass in that place where it was said to them, You are not my people. There shall be said to them, You are sons of the living God. You know what Israel is saying to Israel? He's saying, I haven't forgotten my promise to you. Listen. Listen to me. Some of you here today may feel like you're abandoned by God. You don't feel his presence. You don't feel his joy. You don't get anything out of church. But this is the reality. God hasn't abandoned you. He's been searching after you. He's been searching after you. He's promised to never leave you nor forsake you. He don't break his promises. You may have walked away from him, but he ain't given up on you. He loves you. He loves you. In fact, look here. Don't miss this. This is what I love about the scriptures. In verse 11. Then the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together and appoint for themselves one head. They shall come up out of the land and great will be the day of Jezreel. Now Jezreel was a king in Israel. And what the name Jezreel means is shedding of blood. Now don't get miss this. This is what he's saying to Israel. I am going to have one come from you. And there will be a great day for deliverance for you and all the world. And it will be a day of the shedding of blood. You know what he's talking about? That. He's saying, I'm going to do what Hosea did for Gomer for you. I'm going to send one to shed blood for you. And on that day, you will no longer be called rebels. You will no longer be called enemies of God. You will be called sons of the living God. God, because of what I'm going to do for you. And church, this is what saddens me. This is what saddens me. And Chris, you go on, come on up. Many of us today who are forgiven, saved, delivered, redeemed by Jesus Christ are doing exactly what Israel did. We're doing exactly what they did. How dare we judge them? We're going back into the motions, aren't we? How many of you got up this morning and said, Boy, I can't wait till that hour's done so I can go do what I really want to do today. 
Huh? How many? Because this is what I know. God did not deliver you and redeem you for that. Man. God did not redeem you for that. So this is what you need to do. You need to do two things this morning. Every single one of us. We need to get real. We need to get real. You know why so many Christians are afraid to get real with God and get real with one another? Because after church, some of you are going to leave this church and you're going to say, I can't believe that preacher wore jeans today. It's going to happen. I know it. I wore it on purpose just for that. You're going to sit there and say, I can't believe that preacher had his shirt untucked. I can't believe the preacher did this or did that. And you know why? Because some of you are so worried about everybody else that you can't get real with yourselves. It makes you feel better to judge others when the reality of it is your heart is far from God. Man, church, if we're going to actually do something in our community, if First Baptist Church in Tompkinsville were to close her doors, would the community even know? That's the question. If we're going to make an impact, if we're going to make a difference, we have got to get real and recognize we're all broken people serving a wonderful Savior. We're all broken. We're all broken. And until we do that, nothing else is going to happen. So we need to get real. Say, God, I'm broken. God, I'm sinful. God, I've turned away from you. I made something in the church that it shouldn't be. And then, secondly, we need to repent. We need to say, God, I'm turning back to you. I'm turning back to you. I want your presence in my life again. How many of you say, man, Lord, I want your presence in my life. I want the joy of my salvation back again. I want to feel like I'm making a difference rather than going through the motions. Man, I was there. And if we can't admit that today, if we can't raise our hands and say, God, I want your presence. I need it. I want the hope. I want the peace. I want the joy. I want the passion. I want the purpose. If we can't do that today, then why are we even here? Why? If we can't say that you're number one in my life, then why are we even here? What's the difference between us and a social club? Man, church, Jesus saved you. Jesus redeemed you for so much more than religion and going through the motions. So if you're here with us today, and you want more out of your faith than what it's become. You've made other gods in your life. Now is the day to turn back to Him, to get real and repent and fall at the feet of Jesus and fall back in love with Him. Will you stand with me as we go into our song of invitation? As I am. I want you. Who would have the courage this morning to take that step while everybody else is looking and saying, God, I've turned from you, but I want you back. That I want your presence, that I want your joy, that I want your salvation, whatever it is. If that's you, you need to come this morning. Don't let someone else's stare stop. Let's get real with God this morning, church.